the mid-1300s in the small Yorkshire town of Tadcaster in northern England. By a simple shallow grave, a body is prepared for burial. There are no grave goods to accompany this person on the last journey to the afterlife, perhaps just a plain shroud. There are no clues as to who this person was, nor what has taken their life. Now a team of archaeologists investigate. They'll use all their experience and a range of techniques. The latest advances in genetic research and hard work in the ground. A lot of people were killed in and around Tadgaster. They'll try to discover who was this person, how did they die, and what can their remains tell us about life more than 600 years ago. There was less fear of death and more acceptance that it was going to happen. Until now, the truth was known only to the medieval world. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. A team of archaeologists investigates medieval life by exploring the world of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man who tries to keep his family alive. In our stores, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You are looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes and think, what did they see? How did they die? The seventh year after it began, it came to England and first began in the towns and ports joining on the sea coasts. In Dorsetshire, where, as in other counties, it made the country quite void of inhabitants so that there were almost none left alive. And finally, it spread over all England and so wasted the people that scarce the tenth person of any sort was left alive. So a chronicler wrote of what befell England in the 14th century. It was a pivotal time in the Middle Ages, across the whole of Europe. The medieval town of Tadcaster, 15 miles south of York in northern England, was no exception. The Yorkshire landscape is prosperous now, Veils the many years of hardship and suffering that ordinary people endured just to get through their daily lives. The average life expectancy was around just 30 years. Things then were bad enough without war, poverty, famine, and disease. It's all dirty backgrounds, people walking around in the mud, the dirt, and the lower echelon of society is, is rough in it. And it wasn't very pleasant. It's easily a third world environment as we would see it today. People live in it at a subsistence level, hand to mouth, uh, the farming at a very basic level. Even when they farm for somebody else, the majority of the, the crop would go to the church and the state. So again, it goes back up out of their system. A lot of medieval aspects of archeology span is knight's armor, the the conflict, uh, rather than focusing at the top end of society, we can now focus on the bottom end of society, the people who lived and worked on the land at a very, very uh, basic level. We can do scientific analysis on their skeletal remains, on their teeth, to find out where they were born, where they were brought up, and uh, what sort of food they ate. And so at a subsistence level, we can now record that, and we can see exactly how they lived and what they went through, and sometimes even how they died. The medieval dead still exist. Around the United Kingdom, skeletal remains are kept for future study. In our stores in England, there are 
hundreds if not thousands of skeletons that have not been analysed yet. Many of them were excavated in the 60s and 70s. Some are still even unwashed, but these skeletons still warrant analysis. The University of York's Department of Archaeology preserves many such skeletons. The remains of some of the population of medieval Yorkshire. The medieval period is very interesting because there are lots of aspects still that we don't know so much about and it's fascinating to find out more about it. Uh, there are documents that might um, relate to propaganda um, or political intrigues and so on that distort the actual evidence and when we have the skeletons themselves and the archaeology itself we can see what really happened in the medieval period. I think, I think the general public is surprised that there's still so much to be left to be discovered about the medieval period. People relate to other people, so the medieval skeletons are very fascinating to the general public. In the medieval period you see very different diseases that you might than compared to the post-medieval period or the early medieval period or the Roman period. Um, you try to think about the social context, whether they were from a richer side or a less well-off side, and then you try to look for patterns, whether there, there was malnutrition at the site, if it was a poorer site, or whether there were all very tall people on a, on a wealthier site. So you try to put the skeleton straight away into its archaeological context. The medieval period is clearly a very great distinction between different classes and um, between different uh, social status of individual, but also a total misunderstanding of diseases and also their cures. Marlin is often called in to carry out analysis on bones found at the many archaeological sites in and around York and all over the UK. Her work entails establishing all the facts she can about an individual who lived hundreds of years ago, from the bones they leave behind. I'm an osteoarchaeologist and what we do is we visually analyse the skeleton, so we determine the age, the sex, the living height and any diseases the person suffered from or any injuries they suffered from. It's usually not possible to tell the cause of death. And then there are specialists who undertake biomolecular studies of human skeletons and they can determine much more about the diet of the person by undertaking destructive analysis of the teeth and bones and they can also often tell where an individual came, comes from through isotope analysis. Among the breakthroughs in biomolecular research is DNA analysis. This is revolutionising osteoarchaeology unlocking whole new areas of potential for the study of skeletal material. In future, there will be these, this new generation DNA analysis, which are called SNPs, where you can determine the eye colour, the hair colour, whether somebody had a coffee allergy and where almost exactly somebody came from. But that's something in the future that we can do with these assemblages that are still stored in British museums. Most of the skeletons she analyzes come from sites where the archaeology is already understood, often as part of a batch of several sets of remains from a recognized burial context, such as a conventional cemetery. But sometimes there's a skeleton that carries with it a little more mystery. Tadcaster has seen centuries of conflict. A castle once stood here from the days of the Normans, though it was a ruin for most of the medieval period. Not far from the town's main church, the site has lain for centuries as waste ground. Raids from the north, battles in the Middle Ages, and the English Civil War have all left their mark on the area. While the Castle Hill site has remained empty, and largely free from modern building. Few people ever realized though, that it was a place of death and decay. Simon Richardson was just a boy here, when one school holiday, he heard that a grim discovery had been made in the garden at Castle Hill. 
It sparked in him a lifelong passion for history and archaeology. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I asked the landowner, or the homeowner, if I could have a look around the garden. People said that this um, undulating landscape was a Roman castle, but uh, it wasn't a Roman castle. Even at 11 years old, I knew it was a Motton Bailey uh, from around the period of the Norman Conquest. The chap who had the garden, he let me look around. I came back a few more times. Uh, one particular day, he showed me some photographs. And they were talking 1975, I was 11. My eyes must have lit up. There were photographs of skeletons which had, uh, had, been, had been excavated uh, from his garden. Just over, over here, in fact. <clears throat> and I missed the excavation by a few months. And it turns out he'd found, he found a bone whilst digging a small vegetable patch. Um, it went to the uh, police and then to the coroner. And they decided that there were human remains. It was a, it was a, a, a bone from the arm. The remains they'd found were very, very old. They investigated a few areas within the garden. And I think they turned up about 12, 12 individuals. I remember one specific photograph, and it was of a skull, and it had a rhomboid hole in the side of its head, which is like a, a sort of a squat diamond shape. So it was all very, very interesting, and I came for quite a number of years, and I was found a, a large number, uh, a large amount of pottery, mainly medieval, but quite a bit of Roman. But I also found some musket balls, um, which had been eroding out of the slope uh, on the motto over there and they were from the Battle of Tadcaster, which was 1643. As Simon's enthusiasm for archaeology grew, he kept going back to Castle Hill to help where he could as the local historical society explored the site. But then almost two decades went by, and after a change in ownership, Simon found the site little resembled the place he knew from childhood. Quite some number of years later, I came back to the garden and I was totally taken aback by what I saw. The garden was completely overgrown. I was asked to come down and, and clear the grounds. It was a huge task and it took some weeks. One of the first things I did was remove a large hemlock plant, which is a very poisonous plant, which had grown just to the other side of the yew tree there. So just at a fairly shallow depth, I got under the roots and my spade just caught on something which was, I thought was a stone, but it turned out to be a skull. It was a completely unexpected find, and it left Simon wanting to find out more. There was no evidence as to when the body had been buried, though there was one possible clue as to the individual's fate. A small trauma mark on the skull. About 96. Um, the mass grave was found at Towton, at Towton Hall. I saw some photographs of some of the skulls which had been excavated at Towton, and they had in the side of the head these rhomboid-shaped holes. Simon had heard of the excavations at Towton Battlefield, where Tim Sutherland had been at work to recover the remains of victims of the battle in 1461. Remembering the skull with a rhomboid hole in the side of its skull and the ones at Towton, so putting two and two together. What I'd found there might have been a victim from, from the Battle of Towton. So then I got in touch with Tim. Several of the skeletons had trauma marks, including rhomboid holes, thought to have been caused by war hammers or poleaxes. Could the skull belong to a combatant who'd fled the battle during the rout and was killed or died of wounds at Tadcast? In 2009, Tim and Simon carried out an excavation on the spot where Simon had found the skull. They unearthed the rest of the skeleton and several more partial skeletons. It seemed as if the site had been used as a cemetery, yet intriguingly, this was outside the bounds of the nearby medieval churchyard. It wasn't straightforward though. Many of the remains were less than ideally preserved. When we carried out the excavation, we came down onto several uh, uh, skeletons, but they're all very fragmentary or in not very good condition. And then we came down on this one skeleton that was in good condition and there was more of it showing than the others. And so we thought, right, uh, it was quite a robust person. This, this bone was in really good condition. So we thought, right, this is the one that we'll try to find out more about. 
Uh, and so we fully excavated it and recorded it and pulled it out of the ground and we thought, right, this hopefully will be a good enough sample to represent the other skeletons that we found in the whole of the site. Recording data about the location, orientation and potential age of the burial was vital if clues were to be gathered that could help explain the strange burial. We're assuming that this one um, skeleton is representative of everybody in this, in this uh, cemetery because it's in a strange location. It's in the middle of a medieval castle that was um, falling into ruins and there was a cemetery, a perfectly good cemetery, just down the hill that they should have really been using. So why weren't they using that? And also some people are buried face down, some people are buried face up, most of them are east-west, but they all seem to be in little groups as if they've been rushed. The, burial of, the, the burials have been rushed. So there's something very unusual going on. Was it possible that the grave was conflict related, like the one at Towton? Tim needed to consider the many layers of history affecting Tadcaster to try and understand the confusing nature of the archaeology at Castle Hill. We have an anomaly that we have skeletons in the ground and we thought it'd be easy enough. We excavated them. Usually we can date them by the associated pottery or whatever, and therefore you can apply a period and then you can hypothesize that they were killed in a civil war or you know, they were Romans or whatever, or Vikings. And then what happened was that the context they were in was completely undecipherable. And so what we needed to, to, to fix them, anchored down to a period, was a dating mechanism. That's really clear, hasn't it? Well, that was, yeah, we couldn't even we're walk all, over uh, there, could we? They're all big trees on there, they're all gone. It's really opened it up. Yeah, look at that. Several years after the excavation, Simon and Tim returned to Castle Hill. The site has changed a lot since they were here, just as it's done throughout its history over hundreds of years. You remember when we first came in here, that tree, the half oh, of the it brambles. was almost covered in brambles, brambles wasn't it? Yeah. Between that tree and that tree, there was hardly any space at all. And right out here. About and an inch a, thick, so there was a huge, huge, yeah, huge big brambles and also the big, big uh, rabbit warren underneath. On this piece of ground we've got basically we've got evidence of Roman remains, potentially a fort or a fortlet. It's something that was guarding the river crossing here. We've got bits and pieces that might be Anglo-Saxon uh, and then we're into the 11th century when for some reason there was a castle built on this site, the classic Motton Bailey, small Motton Bailey wooden timber palisaded castle that was built in the 11th century, obviously to guard the river crossing exactly the same way as the Roman fort would have been. The, the medieval castle was only in existence for about 100 years. And so I presume... It's that unusual that, isn't it? Yes, it was never developed into anything other than the, uh, the original Motton Bailey timber castle. It was never fortified with or extensively with, uh, with stonework. And so presumably it just wasn't significant as a location for a castle anymore. And the development of the town is probably 12th, 13th, 14th century. And therefore that's when the major river crossing moves away from the ford here onto the, uh, the pleasant location of the bridge. And that's when the town develops around the bridge, as they quite often do. Yeah. And then of course this place is abandoned completely. And there's nothing here then for a significant number of years, possibly even until the English Civil War when it was re-fortified to a certain degree. We know that because it's, it was obviously fought over. Yeah. And then it looks like it was abandoned completely until the 18th century, or the late 17th, 18th century, when, when, the they, house when they built the house. And then, of course, they turned it into formal gardens. And that brings up the question as to why these skeletons that were found here in the 70s and then we subsequently refound. Why were these skeletons buried on uh, these bodies buried on the top of this hill? Are they Roman? Are they Anglo-Saxon? Are they Norman? Are they post-Roman? Are they English Civil War, for example? Are they people that died mm. during one of the sieges of Tadcaster, or are they significantly later? And we need to know that. The important bridge at Tadcaster forms a vital crossing point of the River Wharf. Historically. Its position has held significant strategic importance. This means the town has been no stranger to war over the centuries, particularly in the medieval period. Tim had to consider a number of possibilities to support the idea that the skeleton might have been the result of conflict. In the early 14th century, 
the Scottish leader, William Wallace, led attacks into England, and many were killed during his raids on the York area. It's not commonly known that the Scots travelled this far south and succeeded in creating a lot of damage, but they did. They moved further south than this, and there were conflicts in and around you know, this area, uh, and it's known that there was conflict when the Scots invaded in the early 1300s down here. But the most significant military event in the Tadcaster area for hundreds of years, dated to the 15th century, more than 150 years after Wallace. In 1461, thousands of men fled through the town, routing from the Battle of Towton, just a few miles away. One of the reasons we thought there may have been a cemetery here is the extension of the cemetery needed when, in 1461, after the Battle of Towton, there was a significant route between Towton through Tadcaster on the way to York, which is on the, on the same route. And what happened is that significant numbers of people were caught because the bridge had been broken by the Lancastrians in order to stop the Yorkists invading York. And so what happened is there's a lot of people who were killed in and around Tadcaster at the time. We know this from the documentary evidence. And we thought, well, potentially this could be a cemetery associated with the dead people that were, uh, were caught up in the Wars of the Roses. And of course, by dating the skeleton to potentially the mid-1400s, it might have been the case that that was what has happened. Ascertaining why the skeleton was buried here was not going to be simple. It wasn't even clear what sex it was. Detailed analysis was needed. Marlin Holst was asked to carry out the osteological analysis of the Tadcaster skeleton. There are certain individuals that really stick out, um, partly maybe because they have unusual pathology or because um, they have a particularly well-preserved skeleton, um, but some you really connect with and you feel for them if they suffered or, um, or you see what circumstances they were buried under and you're trying to understand um, the reasoning behind that. So some people you really do connect with. The bones were strong and solid, showing signs of a relatively long life of hard work. What's more, the bones appeared to be those of a woman. This meant the skeleton couldn't be that of a soldier. But could the victim still have been in the grave as a result of conflict? A clue on the skeleton at first caused him to speculate the woman might have died through being caught up in a battle or its aftermath. One of the marks on the skull, as Simon had found, seemed to indicate trauma an injury. We initially thought there was some head trauma. It looked like a blade wound on parts of the skull. And so we got really excited and thinking, this is it. It is uh, a result of head trauma during conflict or whatever. Subsequently, had the skeleton analysed and it looked like it was, it was done by a spade. And of course, these skeletons are just, just below the surface. So of course, obviously with a little bit of overactive uh, digging, uh, you could cause some damage to the skeletal material. The radiocarbon result finally puts paid to the idea of a conflict-related cause of death. The skeleton was from the mid-1300s. This put it too late to be as a result of Wallace and too early for Towton. One by one, the options were being eliminated. So, of course, that's another thing we can just wipe away and say, fair enough, you know, now we've managed to cancel that. So it's like the, we know that they're not Roman. We know they're not Anglo-Saxon. We know they're not from the 15th century to the Wars of the Roses. We know they're not Civil War soldiers that were fighting in and around the uh, settlement here and the castle itself. And so we managed to squeeze it down to a very narrow period of time. Tim was forced to think again. What else was going on in the mid-1300s in Yorkshire? This is where we start getting uh, some interesting results because we radiocarbon dated it 
and uh, it dated quite securely to the early to mid 1300s because the castle has already been abandoned by them if the castle's been abandoned it's obviously waste ground it might have been farmed or cultivated as a private allotment but if something happened in a very short period of time that accumulated large numbers of dead people in a small cemetery and that was unusual rushed burials particularly of more than one body could suggest a cause of death that in some ways was even more terrifying than battle one of the things that immediately strikes you is that the whole of Europe was decimated by the Black Death, by the plague. Between a third and half the population potentially died, of, of Europe died. A, a significant number of people died in and around Tadcaster. And that means that the cemeteries would have been full. Within a few months or a year or so, the cemeteries would have been full. Uh, because there's just nowhere else to put them. There could be potentially hundreds of people dying in a very short period of time in and around Tadcaster and the surrounding district, because remember, this is a parish church. And so, of course, it attracted a lot of people from in and around Tadcaster, significantly distant from Tadcaster itself. And so they would have been drawn here to be buried uh, after their life had ended. The Black Death ripped across the landscape, wiping out entire communities, Yorkshire was no exception. For the people of medieval England who experienced it, life was never the same again. Piers Mitchell lectures in biological anthropology at the University of Cambridge. He's studied how what we now know as bubonic plague spread throughout medieval Europe. There are certain epidemic diseases like bubonic plague that many people would have never experienced until the epidemic swept through. And then virtually everyone would have been exposed to it and a proportion of people would have died. For example, in the Black Death in 1348, perhaps 50, 60 percent of people seem to have died in Europe. Coping with such catastrophic losses must have been traumatic for the survivors who had to rebuild their lives. We have to remember that in medieval Europe, uh, attitudes to death were somewhat different to what they are now. Uh, religion was very important, and the place of the church was very important. So, although no one particularly wanted to die, there was a much stronger thought that what's important is that you live your life so you go to heaven when you do die. So unlike today, there was less fear of death and more acceptance that it was going to happen. And people were taught by the church that what's important is when you did die, you'd lived a good enough life to go to heaven. And so there were slightly different attitudes to disease and different attitudes to death. You didn't necessarily have to be cured of a disease to have a good life, but so long as you prayed and ticked all the boxes from the point of view of, of the church, then it didn't matter if you died early, because if you went to heaven, that's what life was all about to the medieval monk. The Black Death outbreak in the 14th century killed large numbers of people very quickly. Up to now, the only known evidence for mass deaths of this kind is from London. Could the comparatively small number of skeletons at Tadcaster also be a result of the plague. The problem is we assume that the individuals from the Black Death were buried in massive pits. Well, a lot of that wouldn't have been possible in normal churchyards. They were usually packed with remains, so it's likely that a lot of the, these plague pits were actually not in consecrated ground or were in ground that was later consecrated. Um, and I'm sure there have been assemblages found in Britain where the assumption has been that they are plague cemeteries, but um, it hasn't been proven. Marlin set about finding how to verify whether the woman had died from Black Death, and a recent discovery in bioarchaeology provided the means to do so. DNA analysis techniques have developed dramatically in recent decades caused by the Yersinia pestis bacteria 
and transmitted to humans by the fleas of infected rodents. Bubonic plague, or Black Death, is a pathogenic killer. Though Yersinia pestis was discovered in 1894, its genome has only recently been decoded. This genomic sequence now allows scientists to pinpoint the existence of bubonic plague in the intact DNA of ancient skeletons. Michelle Mundy is an expert on analysing the biomolecular structure of archaeological specimens. When we have a skeleton and we can look at it morphologically, can we, say, we can say certain things about it. And then if you want to get down to the molecular level and look at DNA, um, what we can look at, we can look at different genes. We can say, um, you know, more or less what colour eyes um, someone might have had in the past. Um, we can look at um, skin, skin tone. We can look at um, things like whether they had runny earwax or not. These are all genes that we know that we know what they do, so that we can, we can look for them, we can look for the genetic changes that cause these particular features um, to arise in your, um, in your body. All of these things will tell us something about a person in the past. They might not have actually manifested them completely, so we might be able to say, this person contains, has the gene for this, but we don't know how much that was actually manifested in their actual life. I don't think we'll ever definitely get to that. There's a difference between what's in our genetics and what we actually did throughout life. So a lot of what we look like and, and, and our personalities is, you know, as you know, half about what's in our genes and what's in our lifestyle, how we've been brought up. Marlin visits Michelle to find out more about the skeleton from Tadcaster. would be interesting to see whether this skeleton actually is related um, in any way or the mass grave is related in any way to the Black Death. What's inside is what we're actually going to be sampling, um, which is the dental pulp, which is right in the centre of the tooth. So what the specialists will do when they actually, actually have the tooth, they'll probably cut it all longitudinally down the middle and scrape out with a small dental implement um, the pulp that's inside and use that for the DNA. Although you can get DNA out of any tissue that's surviving, um, the best to go for, or the best um, material to go for, would be the teeth, because the dental enamel is what's protecting the DNA inside. It's much harder for things to get inside teeth than it is to, for things to get inside bone, and vice versa to get out as well. So you want to use a tooth that is um, as intact as possible, has as much of the enamel there which would have protected um, the DNA inside, and we want these roots to be um, fused. We're going to have to take one of these teeth out of the jaw and we were going to go for this one here. Yeah. Um, unlike the other ones, it doesn't have quite as much wear. There are There is a bit of wear on the top there, but hopefully that hasn't actually reached um, um, the dental pulp inside. So that's probably going to be the best one for the job. So, so the we're going to go for the site code. C-A-D-C-H-09. And we're going to go for Y pestis, Yersinia pestis, which is the um, causative agent of uh, the Black Death. The trouble with plague is that it kills you too quickly for your skeleton to react to it. So we'll need to use DNA because you won't be able to look at a skeleton and say, we think this person has died of plague. Whereas you can look at a skeleton and say, we think this person might have been suffering from tuberculosis or leprosy um, and those sorts mm -hmm. of ailments. We can look at the skeleton for that because they are long-term diseases where your bone often, you know, they might have had it for a long time, and in which case your bone has um, actually reacted to the disease. Plague, no chance. Well, the DNA analysis would be very, very interesting in terms of um, whether we can tell whether this individual did suffer from the plague, because as Michelle has said, this is something that we just cannot do from the osteological analysis of the skeleton. Did the woman die as a result of plague? As the plague spread across Europe, it had a great effect on the structure of society. 
Entire cultures had to adapt quickly to enormous losses in their working population. The Black Death swept right across Europe from 1348 to about 1352 and had major effects, not only on people's lives, but the social structure of Europe at that time. It seems that perhaps 50 or 60 percent of people across Europe died during the Black Death. Firstly, it would have profound effects on the genetics of medieval Europeans. If you think there's something different about the 60% that died and the 40% that didn't. So it's quite likely to have significantly affected our gene pool now, so that we may be better able to resist certain kinds of infectious disease because those of us that couldn't cope with the Black Death had our genes removed from society. Secondly, it had significant effects upon the population number. A lot of the poor had to rely on the little work that was available. They were attached to the land. They couldn't move about and live where they wanted to. A lot of them were, you know, had to live where their hut was and they had to give a lot of their income and work for a particular landover or noble. When you have 60% of workmen die, then you suddenly have this bizarre position where there's a shortage of labour and people can move around because the landowner next door is prepared to pay you to go and work for him. And people could move to towns and get work there because all the labourers were dead. And so suddenly people weren't tied to the land anymore. They weren't semi-slaves to the nobility. And we have a complete breakdown and change in the way people saw the ability to advance themselves, to move around the country and to change their career path. So in many different ways, the Black Death had a major effect on both Britain and the rest of Europe, so that we find life in the 12th and 13th century is very different to the late 14th and 15th century. Societal changes like this help pinpoint events such as plague in the historical record. Even though until very recently, there was no way to identify archeological evidence. Now the DNA results are in, and Tim has exciting news. But just before we've done the research, somebody finds the DNA of the Yersinia pestis. And so obviously, to, not to utilise that would have been crazy. So we asked them, and it tentatively looks as though it's evidence of the plague, which is unbelievable. And it's very unusual, I believe, because to find a plague cemetery that's not either a mass grave or somewhere very urban, like uh, London, for example, where they found huge burial pits from a pl huge plague pit. But to find what looks like almost a normal cemetery with, with evidence of the plague in it is fantastic. And so it, it leads on to, to other things. You know, what can we say about this cemetery? What can we find out about the plague that's not evidence in um, a mass plague pit, for example? And so it's really good news for us. We've answered the main question. It does look like it's a plague cemetery. Uh, that ties in with the date really nicely. It also explains why they're where they are in an old abandoned castle. And so in terms of the remit of why we're doing the research, we've got a result. It's been fantastic. The, the presence of Yersinia pestis in the DNA of the skeleton from Tathcaster is extremely interesting because we are only just starting to be able to even detect the DNA for Yersinia pestis, the genome for Yersinia pestis has only just been found about a year and a half ago. So this is very new stuff. We can never normally tell the, the how people died until, unless it was a traumatic death, for example, a, a skull injury or something like that. So it's very rare that we can say what a person's cause of death is. And in this case, of course, we also can't say Yersinia pestis, or the plague was definitely the cause, but it's very likely um, if, if she suffered from, from the plague, then it's, it's likely that that was the cause of death. So would this explain the burials at Tadcaster in the remains of the castle away from consecrated ground? The problem of having to bury sudden large numbers of dead would have given the people of Tadcaster a serious problem. What's happening is the normal method of dying and the disposal of the dead 
has been interrupted. Well, there are just large numbers of dead. The cemetery is expanding to its limits. And now we've got evidence that it's actually burst out of the cemetery and it's gone into this waste ground, which was the old abandoned medieval castle. Every day, one or two people are dying in a very local community. So imagine if you people you know and they're literally dying around you, one after the other, one day after another, and then another one goes, another one goes. And it must have induced some sort of terror in you because you don't know when you're going to go or if you're going to go. Uh, and so the whole atmosphere mu must have been really charged by this whole uncertainty about are you going to survive? So are you going to end up on this hill in an abandoned castle? up outside a normal cemetery. But you would have heard about it in throughout Tadcaster, throughout the whole of York, throughout the whole of England, and beyond England. It's, it was spreading across Europe. Even though it's known that plague affected almost all the country, DNA analysis like this provides a way of finding conclusive archeological proof. There's only really one known plague cemetery in Britain, and that's Smithfield in London, um, where it was always suspected that actually these were plague victims, and the individuals are buried in, in large pits. So that it could have also been another disease, but that was proven um, very recently that these appear to have had the plague. So this is really only the second um, um, individual or the second assemblage from Britain where this has been proven so it's very exciting. And the excavation only uncovers um, a couple of skeletons and only one of those was lifted so we don't really know the extent of the grave or or the, the number of skeletons but it's possible that this is a, a plague pit and there are many skeletons there. Many questions have been answered about the life and death of a woman buried in a shallow grave with a few other individuals over six and a half centuries ago. For Simon Richardson, it's decades since his childhood interest and enthusiasm for archaeology set him on the way to discovering the skull at Castle Hill. I suppose it's, this garden's played a bit of an important part in my life because, you know, finding what I found here, I mean, there's a this is just some of the examples of the, the pottery I was finding in the flower beds. I suppose you could say this handful of pottery got me where I am today. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work on, uh, on battlefields and other medieval sites around Britain and Europe. So I have a lot to be thankful for. The woman whose body Simon discovered had lain within sight of the church in which he himself was married and in which his children were christened. It's a reminder that the archaeology we find in the ground is often all that remains of the trace of a human life. Such is the fragility of what we leave behind beyond written record or living memory. Crikey. I've lived in Tadcaster over 40 years and I've never expected to see it like this. You do think about these people when you dig them up. Uh, I mean, they're only bones, they're only human remains when we find them, but who was she? Was she an important person within the town? Was she a mother? Um, no, she probably worshipped in this church. Um, she probably crossed the bridge nearly every day um, to go to the other side of the town. Just drank in some of the old, the old taverns and things. Mm. Washed her clothes in the river. These things we'll, we'll never know. I mean, all we have are the, the human remains to go on. But it doesn't stop you thinking. Uh, once upon a time, you know, she was a living, breathing person. 
and she's ended up in this well it's a bit of worse ground um, we now know she died a horrible death and she died of the plague If I had knocked on the door all those years ago, when I was 11 years old, she'd probably still be laid dead there in the ground, undiscovered, forgotten about. York, second city of England in medieval times. Daily life is hard enough without the ever-present shadow that stalks all members of society, from kings to beggars. Centuries before the discovery of penicillin, people go about their lives knowing that only church or meagre charity will be their help if they fall prey to the spectre of disease. For more than 700 years, a woman lay buried below the old stone streets of York. There was no record of who she was, nor of the awful condition she had to endure without hope of a cure. You accepted death was going to be with you soon. Now new research is unlocking the story of her life by uncovering the evidence contained in her bones. It could be the proto-NHS, but a long, long time ago. The medieval world, the 5th to the 15th century. A team of archaeologists investigates medieval life by exploring the world of the medieval dead. We have a classic view of the storybook medieval life. We don't hear the stories about the common man trying to keep his family alive. In our stores, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of skeletons. Archaeologically speaking, we can now focus in on the medieval dead people. You're looking for clues in the skeleton all the time. And you couldn't help almost look through their eyes to think, what did they see? How did they die? I forbid you ever to enter a church, a monastery, a fair, a mill, a market, or an assembly of people. I forbid you to leave your house unless dressed in your recognizable garb and also shod. I forbid you to share house with any woman but your wife. I command you if accosted by anyone while traveling on a road, to set yourself downwind of them before you answer. I forbid you to enter any narrow passage, lest a passerby bump into you. I forbid you, wherever you go, to touch the rim or the rope of a well without donning your gloves. I forbid you to touch any child or give them anything. I forbid you to drink or eat from any vessel but your own. The words of the mass of separation, thought by some to have been spoken by medieval churchmen to sufferers of leprosy. In the middle of the Middle Ages, around the 10th to 11th century, the medieval world rises. As the Dark Ages are gradually left behind, 
the rate of change within society gathers momentum. Across Europe and the Near East, societies experience huge change. Birth rates increase and populations grow. Migration between countries increases and within countries, migration from the land to urban areas. Towns and cities grow to accommodate vast new populations and more people brings more problems such as overcrowding, poverty, war. As if the everyday folk of the medieval world didn't have enough hazards to contemplate, it's a time of expansion too for mankind's greatest enemy, disease. It's an age still several centuries before the discovery of bacteria and penicillin. In cramped towns and remote rural areas alike, Sanitation and hygiene were misunderstood or completely absent. The 15th century Dutch cleric Erasmus knew how filthy were the houses of most people. Floors are laid with white clay and are covered with rushes, occasionally renewed, but so imperfectly that the bottom layer is left undisturbed, sometimes for 20 years, harboring expectoration vomiting, the leakage of dogs and men, ale droppings, scraps of fish, and other abominations not fit to be mentioned. Conditions were perfect for bacteria and the spread of infection. Disease had no equal in the misery it could inflict. There were no defences against it, no inoculations, no cures. By our standards today, it's inconceivable the people of medieval England endured such living conditions. Did they have a really pleasant life, live a life of luxury, eat the right foods, have a really pleasant, you know, rich lifestyle? Or did they suffer some of the most horrendous diseases known to man, leprosy, syphilis, things that really affected them and even took their, the evidence with them to the grave? And so looking at the skeleton, you can see them and say, that was not a nice way to live or to die. Archaeologists now recognize that much can be learned from the study of disease. Its effects are locked away in the archaeological record, in the skeletal remains of the population of the Middle Ages, the medieval dead. Charlotte Roberts has spent her career studying archaeological human remains through the lens of biological research. She's a bioarchaeologist. I think the term bioarchaeologist melds the two disciplines of biology, so looking at the biological evidence for disease, with the archaeological context. I need to understand the archaeology of the site from which these skeletons come from to be able to interpret the evidence for disease that I see in the skeletons. Charlotte is an expert in paleopathology, the study of diseases within the archaeological record tracing their history and development. It's a relatively new discipline, having grown primarily over the past 50 years. But now recently it's been helped by developments in new methods, such as DNA analysis of the pathogens that cause infectious disease. It's a branch of archaeology which has the potential to influence current or future healthcare. Can we, as paleopathologists, actually study those diseases and help explain, inform what we see today and perhaps predict the future? We know, even just from historical documents in the past, that a lot of infectious diseases were pretty rife in the medieval period and a lot of that was to do with the type of living conditions people had, the types of diet they were eating or what, what diets they weren't eating. So these, these people are from late medieval York, buried at uh, a site called Fishergate House, um, about 200 of them, and a lot of them were non -ad we would call non-adults, so they're not adults in age. At the University of Durham, students learn how to spot evidence of disease. It's part of the skill of a bioarchaeologist detecting the traces of infection on skeletal remains. 
Yeah. And it actually is... To be able to teach and research in paleopathology, you need to have skeletal remains or mummified remains to, to work with. In the medieval period, there seemed to be a, a huge range of infectious diseases, many of which that we wouldn't actually be able to see on the skeleton because they only affect the soft tissues. But the key ones for me would be tuberculosis and leprosy, both caused by bacteria, as is something called treponemal disease. So those three, what I would call specific infections, were, were ones that ca could cause damage to the skeleton and were pretty frequent in the medieval period. One of the most prevalent of these medieval diseases was syphilis still known today as a venereal condition. Archaeologist and paleopathologist Don Brothwell has studied ancient diseases in human and animal remains for almost half a century. That, that is suspicious, as if it could be surgical. <laughs> First of all, you've got to realise that there are three clinical diseases uh, and venereal syphilis is just one of them. And that probably, if you're thinking in terms of an evolutionary tree of diseases, um, that is close to the other two, but in fact probably is the last evolving venereal syphilis from this other group called the treponemes, or treponematosis, the whole group is called. And the other two are endemic syphilis and yours. Endemic syphilis, you, you pick it up, usually d during the first 10 years of your life. It's linked with um, poor hygiene, sharing food vessels and that sort of thing. So it, it's within family groups, you're, you're all together eating, sharing food utensils and so on. So this is where it all begins. So it, it's easily caught during childhood and then it gradually progresses through into the adult period. Now endemic syphilis was probably um, affected a lot of the populations during medieval times in the Near East. Now our connection there of course was with, with the Crusades for instance. So we're likely to have probably picked up endemic syphilis and brought it through into Northern Europe. I think at that stage probably well-defined venereal syphilis, sexually transmitted syphilis, probably wasn't around or was extremely uncommon. Through his work in paleopathology, Don believes that syphilis underwent a fundamental change, identified through remains in the archaeological record. The transformation happened within the medieval period, at the height of the great population changes then occurring. But what I think was happening during the medieval period was that, in fact, the disease endemic syphilis was becoming transformed, and it was becoming transformed because it had to move through into northern Europe, into different societies in colder climates and so on. So the medieval world was very interesting from this point of view for the evolution of venereal syphilis, I think. This is really quite an interesting phenomenon that was going on during the medieval period. We know diseases have changed. They change their face through the years, modifying themselves and so on. I mean, Darwin would have been excited by this, and he didn't know about it at the time. We don't know how many times it's changed. This is something which we still really have to study. We can study the evolution of man, but in relation to that, there's also the evolution of the diseases which were following him through time, as it were. The work of paleopathologists is being aided as more skeletal remains become available for study. Less stigma is attached now than in previous eras to excavating Christian burials from the medieval period and even later. Now, in terms of numbers of bones or skeletons, let's just take uh, England or Britain. Now we're excavating more Christian burial grounds and that's why they're beginning to turn up in more numbers. 
So we, ha we have now quite a few cemeteries, either earlier medieval or later medieval. One of the most notorious diseases of the medieval period still carries with it today the stigma of uncleanliness and decay. It was a terrible condition to endure in medieval times, though it was, and still is, one made worse for sufferers by the plethora of myths, superstitions, and inaccuracies which surround it. The Bible did nothing to alleviate this. One myth about leprosy is that it's described in the Bible, and unfortunately, that myth has led to the continued stigmatization of people with leprosy today. But it, it is believed now that, that the word in the Bible that people have used as indicating leprosy was a mistranslation of a Hebrew word, which basically means uh, skin diseases, impurity, but not leprosy specifically. Misrepresentations like this I mean, leprosy is still generally regarded as being incurable. Another myth is that leprosy is incurable, but it is curable with antibiotics. And in fact, the treatment's been free since 1995. So if people can get access to the treatment, then they can be cured. So leprosy is curable, but people call it the living death. By modern standards, it's a serious but curable infection. Leprosy is a bacterial infection, so caused by bacteria. The bacteria ends up in the lungs, usually from someone with leprosy coughing and sneezing over someone else, and then they inhale the droplets containing the bacteria. So it establishes itself in the lungs, um, and then potentially it will spread um, to other parts of the body. The bacteria affects the bones of the face, mainly the architecture of the nasal area. It can also affect the nervous system, the sensory nerves, motor nerves, and the autonomic nervous system. Sufferers lose their sense of feeling, leading to damage to the fingers and toes going unnoticed and becoming ulcerated and infected, which can then spread to the bones. Another crude myth dogs leprosy sufferers, that they lose fingers and toes. Again, it's a misrepresentation of the disease's symptoms. When the infection affecting the hands and feet, or the hand and foot bones, gets established, the fingers and toes are affected and they tend to absorb. So the ends of the fingers and toes absorb and the fingers and toes get shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, but the skin contracts around what's left of the fingers and toes and the actual nails, the fingernails and toenails, are actually retained. So, so they don't drop off. The toes and fingers just get shorter. So to be able to uh, recognize leprosy in skeletons, we're looking for those facial changes and we're looking for changes in the hands and the feet. Probably the greatest myth surrounding leprosy is that it causes fatality. In fact, it weakens the immune system, meaning death can occur from whatever other infections the individual is also exposed to, such as tuberculosis in medieval times. Yet leprosy sufferers were just as likely to die from everyday conditions such as heart attack or stroke, though they might have lived with the disease for decades beforehand. Leprosy is called a living death because you don't die from it and you can live for many years with it, but you can get complications that will eventually kill you, like kidney problems. Um, but I think the living death phrase attached to leprosy perhaps come through history and I'm not entirely certain that that would have been the case for everyone in the medieval period, feeling that it was the living death.
Is it possible that medieval people had a more pragmatic, accepting view of leprosy than up to now we've given them credit for? Our perceptions today of leprosy are influenced by 19th century attitudes. When sufferers were banished to remote places like condemned criminals, known as leper colonies. So when, when we come to the 19th century and the treatment of people with leprosy then, we see a lot of islands being used for the segregation of people with leprosy. Robben Island off the south coast of, of South Africa was where people were sent with leprosy. Spinalonga, the island off the side of Crete in Greece, um, and Molokai in Hawaii documentary sources suggest their existence wasn't very pleasant. So you can imagine the sort of existence these people were having at that time. The 19th century was the time of mass transportation of criminals, as well as the sufferers of infectious disease. In the medieval period, this practice was still hundreds of years in the future they had to deal with the problem of leprosy in society in different ways. Medical knowledge of disease was still in the realm of alchemy and superstition. If you went to a doctor in medieval period, they would have described the cause of illness as being due to an imbalance of your humours. At that time, the idea of health was based upon the four humours of blood, phlegm, black bile and yellow bile being in balance. And if they were out of balance or if they were corrupted, then that led to illness. Piers Mitchell is a consultant doctor and bioarchaeologist. He studied the principles on which medieval medicine was taught and administered. Now, among the higher clergy, we have this concept that uh, sin may be a cause of illness. In the 13th century, for example, um, the Fourth Lateran Council specifically states that uh, before a doctor should treat a sick patient, they should have abolition of their sins because certain diseases will not get better, regardless of how good a doctor is, unless God forgives the sins that caused it. Most people who fell ill in the medieval period would just be looked after by their family until they got better or died. Those who were wealthy, who could afford a physician, or in fact the nobles who would have employed a physician to look after them full time as such, these people would have had uh, medical intervention and treatment. And of course the physician would assess their humoral balance by looking at their urine, checking their pulse, and all the other ways they would interpret humoral balance. Around the 11th century, as the problem of leprosy grew in European cities, special hospitals began to appear. In the medieval period, we start to see the setting up of hospitals known as leprosaria, which was specifically for people they felt had leprosy. People with leprosy generally wanted to be in these leprosaria. They were felt to be a good place to be. They were looked after, they were fed and watered, they had a chaplain, and they could say prayers and prepare themselves for the next life. And they often saw having leprosy as a way of making penance for their sins so that they'd already had been cleansed of their sins so that they were in a better position to get into heaven. Leprosaria were places where, by relative standards, a genuine humanist approach was adopted, rather than being places to hide away unsightly or undesirable elements of society. Historians are now saying from documentary data that there were actually fairly pleasant places to be, because at least you got fed, and you got a roof over your head, somewhere to sleep, and it was probably better than living in a gutter uh, with no food and no shelter. They are often independent institutions set up by a rich nobleman or a businessman who would want to have a philanthropic way of spending their money, so everyone in town thought they were really nice. But also, it was a way of getting prayers said for their soul, so that when they died, if they were not able to go straight to heaven, there were people praying for them, so that they would then be able to proceed to go into heaven to make up for the sins that they may have made during their life. 
And so we find from the 11th century onwards a rapid rise in the foundation not only of leprosaria for people with leprosy, but also of general hospitals and almshouses and any way that you were providing care for the poor or the needy where they would say prayers for your soul. Medieval leprosy hospitals were different to the later 19th century colonies. There were not places for people cast out from society in forbidden, remote places. They were more a part of society, and their sighting reflected this. Leprosaria were often in the midst of the new busy towns and cities. People talk about the sighting of leprosy hospitals outside city walls, but if you think about it, it was quite a logical place to put them because they were often on roadsides, at crossroads, by bridges, and it was a good place to get charity, you know, to get people to give them money, to get them to give them food. Skeletal remains showing signs of leprosy are rare. The effects of the disease only manifest in the bones in a very small number of cases. Due to the way the disease affects particular parts of the skeleton, such as the bones of the face, they often don't survive well in the ground. In 2007, a skeleton was found following development work in Dixon Lane, York, in the Walmgate area within the medieval walls. The York Archaeological Trust excavated the site, believed to be the cemetery associated with the lost church of St. Stephen's. Osteoarchaeologist Marlin Holst was asked to carry out a full analysis of the skeleton and to confirm that the individual had suffered from leprosy. This um, skeleton here is from the medieval period, probably the high medieval period, so the 12th to 15th century. And she was found um, together with 116 other skeletons in um, the centre of York, not too far from Clifford's Tower. And um, it's a female skeleton, you can tell by this area here of the pelvis, which is very wide. And she was quite old, well, for medieval standards. She was at least 46 years old, but probably older. But unfortunately, because the aging of the skeleton relies on the deterioration of the joints, we can't age skeletons beyond the age of 46. So she could have been 93 years old or 47. Uh, so we can't, we can't tell. So the interesting thing with this skull, we've got some lesions that are associated with leprosy. So the area here of the nose um, is more eroded or is eroded, which normally wouldn't be the case. And that's typical of the so-called rhinomaxillary syndrome in uh, skeletons of individuals with leprosy. She also has lesions in the fingers that could be associated with leprosy. Um, you can see here, this is the first digit of the finger, this part here. And this bit is the middle digit here, so it's this digit there. And you can see that this is normal in shape, but this part here is actually tapered at the distal end. And that's probably um, the result of leprosy and it's the same in all of the central digits or parts of the digits in both hands. I think from looking at the skeleton you can certainly say that she was cared for because she lived to a good age. She probably had the leprosy infection for some time. And normally leprosy infection occurs during childhood or young adulthood so the fact that she's at least 46 years old means that she's lived for some time with this infection. Now what is interesting as well is that she's got very thick dental plaque on some of the teeth. You can get an awful lot of information from this material because basically everything that goes into your mouth can be trapped in this material. This is rock hard, this is very, very tough stuff. So it, it can literally trap anything. There can be ev evidence for smoking or for um, uh, what per people eat, for example, uh, raspberries and so on. Um, there can also be flower weevils. 
So all sorts of things can be trapped in these things and now we have the technology to analyse it. So this is very interesting stuff and the thicker the better. Also the person's DNA that can be trapped there. Research is now being done to broaden the understanding of leprosy and other infectious diseases in archaeology. Up to now, it's not always been possible to say for certain that an individual had leprosy, only if they had had it long enough for it to make recognisable changes on the surface of bones. Yet now, with new DNA techniques, it's becoming possible to unlock information preserved within skeletal remains. At the University of York's Department of Bioarchaeology, Sarah Fidiment and Camilla Speller are developing new techniques to do this. One involves sampling organic material from within one of the best preserved parts of the skeleton, the teeth. In particular, they're interested in the dental calculus, or plaque, that builds up through daily life. If it isn't brushed away, the calculus forms deposits as hard as enamel itself, which can last for thousands of years. So this is the skeleton from Dixon Lane and it does have nice thick deposits of dental plant. Oh wow, it's great. Yeah, no, that is a lot. Do you think that's yeah. thick enough? I think so, yeah. we think so. <laughs> I think if we start with these and just yeah. how much we collect. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's at least five with considerable amounts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Calculus is basically the best reservoir we have of um, the bacterial history of that person. So we have remains of any of the possible diseases caused by bacteria. The remains are basically mineralized and preserved perfectly. So we're managing to get really good information both from DNA and proteins. So it's, it's an invaluable source, really. It starts off as a biofilm on the teeth, so a thin layer um, covering the enamel. And as the bacteria grows and as time goes on, that um, what was a film will become mineralized. And that basically is what preserves all the bacteria in a perfect state. And layers just consecutively grow on top. If you don't clean your teeth, then it just accumulates layer after layer. And these have particularly good calculus. It seems a shame that the dentist comes along now and scrapes <laughs> off all our calculus. You know, we pay them so much to remove it. We hope to do two different analyses on it, or three. Um, we'd like to look at the protein um, component, so looking uh, both at the human proteins but also at the bacterial proteins. Um, we're we're going to do DNA analysis on it um, and, and amplify the bacterial DNA uh, of all the different bacterial species that are in there and hopefully we'll be catching um, the microbacterium that causes leprosy, so microbacterium leprae. And so we're looking uh, speci specifically at this skeleton to see if we can reconstruct the ancient genome of microbacterium leprae, so we can see what leprosy, the genetic makeup of leprosy in the past, and compare it to I today. So. Yeah, We're just only discovering, really, what a rich reservoir calculus is for these bacteria. And so this is one of the first applications, is to look beyond oral bacteria and now look at other, maybe, systemic diseases. Once you combine that you know, with the archaeological context and also with other information that you can get from the skeleton, you can sort of piece together quite a full picture of somebody's life. Sarah and Camilla's research is ongoing, and just one means by which the long-term history of diseases can be explored and tracked through time. The same way human and other behaviours are contained within the archaeological record. Piers Mitchell too has studied the archaeological evidence for infectious disease, in particular through his work in the Middle East relating to the Crusades. He studied how one of the military orders of knights was dedicated to helping with the problem of leprosy in the disease-ridden Crusader states. The Order of St. Lazarus was a, a Latin European style monastic order that was actually set up in the early 12th century in the Middle East as a result of the Crusades. It started off as a medical order where people with leprosy would be looked after by healthy people who were often pilgrims who came out to the East and decided to settle. 
by the 1140s, the Order of St. Lazarus expanded, so it didn't just have this leprosarium outside Jerusalem. It set up one in Acre, and it set up a number of other leprosaria in Caesarea and so on, other places in the Kingdom of Jerusalem and the other Frankish states. We find them expanding so that the leprosaria that had been built in as independent institutions in Europe were then donated by people who couldn't really afford to run them anymore and given to the Order of St. Lazarus. So it was then their job to look after them. What we find is over time, when knights and crusaders either develop leprosy or develop leprosy in Europe but wanted to spend the rest of their life doing something uh, what they felt was really important, they could join the Order of St. Lazarus so that we find that by the 13th century, the Order of St. Lazarus has a significant military component where they fight with the army of the King of Jerusalem. And the Knights of the Order of St. Lazarus would fight in their own component as part of the King's army. But they do tend to have had a reputation of rarely coming back. So while it may be that they deliberately wanted to fight to the death because they felt that if you're going to die fighting the enemies of Christendom, then that may well have meant that you would then go straight to heaven from their, their views on, on what happened after death. But a number of battles in the 1240s and 1250s, we find that either all the members of the Order of St. Lazarus that took part died, or only a few returned alive. Within decades, the Order's influence extended from the Holy Land in the East to England. In England, there were about perhaps 320 leprosaria built altogether during the medieval period, and only eight of them were part of the Order of St. Lazarus. So you can see how the majority of leprosaria were still independent institutions paid for and run by towns or by the nobility. So far as is known, the Order of St. Lazarus operated no hospitals in the city of York, yet Charlotte Roberts believes the woman from Dixon Lane could still have received treatment in the city. She's come to the University of York's Department of Archaeology at King's Manor. Her aim is to find out what she can about medieval York's leprosy hospitals and whether there's a link between any of them and the Dixon Lane burial site. Marlin Holst knows the city's archaeological sites. She's carried out osteological analysis on many of the skeletons from them. I, I did a little bit of research trying to find out how many leprosaria there were in York yeah. in the medieval period. There was quite an early one in the 12th century, St Nicholas. Right, yeah. I think you found that one, haven't yes, you? Yes, yeah. that was excavated by the York Archaeological Trust. The records that remain seem to indicate that the city's leprosaria were places where people in need, who did not necessarily have leprosy, could also receive shelter. I noticed in the documentary evidence for this hospital that both people with leprosy and also the poor were admitted to this hospital. Oh, right. Yeah. So, so, it, was um, so it was a big mix. Uh, the Dix Lane skeleton was part of the St. Stephen's um, Cemetery skeletal assemblage, which was excavated here in this area, which was right next to the um, King's Fish Pool here. And I think that was. Um, excavated together with 113 other skeletons, again, none of which had leprosy, mm. so. Um, is that common then, that they have well, a marginal position? Well, uh, well, it's been suggested that they had a marginal position, but my research also suggests that, generally, skeletons with leprosy from archaeological sites, and this is all over the world that I've located, are not, usually not in leprosaria, and if they are in just normal parish cemeteries, um, they're not marginalised. Oh, right. they're, they're within, well, with everyone else. Yeah. So they're not made special. She was just amongst, right amongst all well, the other yeah. skeletons. Yeah. yeah. If the skeleton was buried in a marginal position, this could indicate an association with leprosy, that the burial was deliberately placed away from other graves. The next step is to try and locate the church where the Dixon Lane woman might have been a parishioner. But the area has changed dramatically with modern development. Looking at the medieval layout of that area might offer up clues. Helen Goodchild helps Charlotte try to zero in on the archaeology around Dixon Lane. 
where the lost church of St. Stephen's is thought to have once stood. Is, I mean, is there any evidence on, on early maps, perhaps, of this St. Stephen's church? So in what period are we talking We're about? We're talking about the 13th, 13th 12th, century. 13th, 14th century. I say, well, the earliest map that we do have for York or that actually shows any kind of real detail for the, for the city itself is the John Speed map, which is actually much later, but mm. it's about 1610. So uh, this is just the modern ordnance survey map. So it's correct geographic coordinates. So if I turn that on um, here and switch off oh the ordnance survey map. So Clifford's Tower is here. So in the, ca the whole castle precinct is here. Mm. Um, so just to the east of that is what is probably the area of Dixon Lane. Mm. The map doesn't show a connection with St Stephen's, but there are several other churches within a very close area, several of which have connections with leprosy. St Mary, St Margaret's, St Dennis and St George's all are very, very near to each other. Mm. There's a number of saints actually associated with leprosy and the foundation of Leprosaria. Uh, George is one of them, but also Giles, Mary Magdalene. There's probably a dozen saints associated with leprosy. Yeah, it is interesting that St George's church is actually located very close to where we think St Stephen's was and where this lady with leprosy was buried. Mm. But what that tells us. Disease was almost impossible to avoid for everyday people in the Middle Ages. So much so that this influenced attitudes towards life and death. Now, infectious diseases in the medieval period were clearly feared. We hear of people that ran away from epidemics, so we know that they wanted to live. They didn't all run to die. But we do also know that attitudes to disease in the medieval period were fairly tolerant of death. They understood that death happened. They didn't all expect to live to a ripe old age. Until relatively recent times, the last hundred or two years, you, your life expectancy was low. So around earlier populations, medieval and prehistoric and so on, they were seeing people dead and gone, their parents, you know, by 30, 40 years of age. And, and that we can't understand nowadays. We can't really get a feel for that. That, that life was short for them all. They didn't see many old folk around. Old in the sense of, you know, 80, 90, 100 years of age. A few would, you know, d make it, but very few. I think we don't realise how much people of those days were, you know, accepted. Life was short and tough if you got a serious condition. You accepted death was going to be with you soon. The church encouraged a fatalistic, yet essentially positive view as to how to live life, knowing that death was never very far away. The teachings from the church told them that if they did die, so long as they had confessed their sins and lived a good life, it didn't matter that they were going to die because they were going to go to heaven. And in that context, the fear of death was something that we would expect would be very different in the medieval period and much less of a problem than we might expect to find in modern people who may not follow a particular religion and who often fear death as a result because they think the end of their life is the end of everything for them. On the streets of York, Charlotte finds the spot in Dixon Lane where the woman lay buried for more than 700 years. All right, so this is Dixon Lane where the St Stephen's Church was and where the cemetery was excavated, obviously in advance of these new buildings here. And it's where the, the lady with leprosy was found. Um, whether there was actually any hospital nearby where this person had access to treatment is another matter. But uh, she was buried in the normal parish cemetery. Um, but she had bone changes of leprosy. Whether the, she'd actually been diagnosed with leprosy is another matter. Um, but it suggest, I, I would suggest that um, she was probably accepted in the community um, as part of that community and was buried in their community churchyard. Perhaps she was 
a valued member of the community, even though she may have been recognised as having this, this infectious disease. It will never be known if the woman buried at Dixon Lane received special care for her leprosy. Yet where she lay was in consecrated ground, in the heart of a city parish, within a short walk of a church whose patron saint was connected with sufferers from that terrible disease. Hers was no exile's burial. She lay at the heart of a community that seems likely to have regarded her plight, at the very least, with compassion. She suffered from one of the worst diseases in human history, and yet she wasn't sent away to die in a closed colony. She was buried in the heart of the society in which she lived, and of which she was a part. To some degree, they are still here because we still have access to them. Sometimes when they develop a cemetery and they have to clear it, the people have to come up. Uh, and us, all, as distasteful as some people might find it, sometimes it's a necessity. Sometimes these, are f these people are found by accident, the skeletons. And we have to do them a service by allowing them to tell us their story. So finding the evidence of these people brings it all back to life. It brings the evidence back straight towards us and it becomes unavoidable. So therefore we've got the buildings, we've got the people, we've got everything. And this is the medieval world and it's a privilege to be able to study it.